As you may imagine, it gives me the deepest satisfaction to be able once more to begin working amongst you, on and in the vicinity of this building of ours. Indeed, anyone who has come in contact with the whole aura of this building today, not only through a deep study of it, but even through a more superficial understanding, may become aware that something is associated with this building which has a connection with the most significant and momentous future tasks of mankind. Especially after my prolonged enforced absence, you may be sure that I have a profound sense of satisfaction to be once again in this place where this building stands as a symbol of our cause. I should also like to emphasize that every time that I return after a long absence, I have a particular satisfaction from being able to see how well and how meaningfully the work on this building is being nurtured by the devoted service of those who are actively engaged on it. Especially in these months of my last absence, when work has been undertaken in such difficult circumstances, certain aspects of the artistic work have progressed in an incomparable way and in the spirit that needs to pervade it in its entirety. But I am also deeply gratified to see that the spirit of our work and of what is coming into being here has led to a real sense of solidarity among many of our friends and a true devotion to what this building embodies. And as one dwells upon this fact, one comes to see that here we have a place which is associated with convictions of such sincerity on the part of a number of friends of our spiritual movement that they give one the assurance that the best impulses of our spiritual movement will flow into the future of humanity, where they are so deeply needed. In the work devoted to this building, there is already something that could serve as a model for all that is intended by what we refer to today as the Anthroposophical Society. On the other hand, however, I often have the feeling that the beneficial and essentially good aspect of what is found here in this building as a result of human work and human feeling consists in this building's objective capacity to free what is wanted by our movement from the subjective interests of individual human beings. Regarding what has just been touched upon here, some remarkable views have been and are still being expressed in all societies of this nature, and equally in the anthroposophical society itself, which are actually remarkable illusions. People preach a lot about selflessness and universal human love, but this is often merely a mask for certain subtle egotistical interests emanating from individual human beings. It is true that these people do not know that their interests are of a purely egotistical nature, and that as regards their individual consciousness, they are in a certain sense innocent but nevertheless, this is how things stand. However, the building demands from a relatively large number of our friends a selfless devotion to something objective, to something standing as a symbol of our cause that is free from any particular personality. And to that extent, what is connected with our building can indeed serve as a model for what our movement seeks to become. My dear friends, when we greet one another again, as we are doing today, we should particularly direct our attention to what is fruitful and all-embracing in this spiritual movement of ours. And as we greet one another in this way, we need to give serious consideration to the thought that, however it may happen, and the manner in which it will do so 
will depend on the circumstances. Mankind will never extricate itself from the terrible blind alley in which it has become lodged in our present age, until the resolve is made in some way to seek a starting point for fruitful activity and fruitful deeds within a spiritual movement such as ours. We shall certainly not insist egotistically that the truth is to be found only within our small confined circle. But we need to be conscious that we are members of a circle where it is recognized that man has got himself into his terrible present predicament by neglecting his spiritual substance. We may recognize ourselves as people who are united with those ideas which can alone lead mankind out of the blind alley where it has now arrived. There is indeed a great deal in the souls of people today that is lacking in clarity. When it has been possible to refresh our understanding here and there of the needs that currently prevail in the view of our spiritual movement, one can say on the one hand, yes, the number of the souls of those who are thirsting for spiritual life in the way that we have in mind has greatly increased. The longing for such spiritual life can well be said to have become infinitely greater, and the attention given to our impulses has also undeniably become greater in recent years, at any rate in those spheres that have been outwardly accessible to me in the last few years, and especially in recent months. It is, moreover, not without significance if I point out that such an intensifying and strengthening of this longing of human souls for spiritual life has become very clearly manifest. To be sure, this strengthening and sharpening of the longing for spiritual life is in strong contrast to that terrible confusion from which, by far, the greater part of mankind is suffering, a confusion which is caused by outworn ideas, or rather an outworn absence of ideas, a languidness with regard to any keen, vigorous thought, languidness that derives from the laxity from the indolence with which intellectual life on earth has been conducted for many decades. This laxity, this indolence, leads people astray in the longing for spiritual life that they experience today. On the one hand, they have a real longing for spirituality, for strong, supersensible impulses. On the other hand, they are fettered by all the old forces that do not wish to withdraw from the scene of human activity, but should nevertheless be able to see, from the contribution that they have made to this very activity, that they no longer have a place there. One might say that this dark impression, that impression of a bilateral cleft, is to be found everywhere. I have given lectures illustrated with slides in a number of places, in Hamburg, Berlin, and Munich, about the group that will stand at the focal point of our building. It has, on the one hand, been possible to see what powerful impulses enter the souls of those who, because of the circumstances of recent years, have never been able to have a glimpse of what is going on here. A new understanding of man is arising from the very way in which the impulses of Araman and Lucifer have been conceived, portrayed, and made manifest together with that of Christ through our group. It grips people's souls when what is thus depicted is presented to them. On the other hand, however, we find everywhere the obstructive influences of the all-pervading remnants of what is old and degenerate in our so-called cultural life. This could be seen particularly from what 
one might well call the deeply humorous way in which the lectures were received that I gave at the art center of our friend Herr von Bernus in Munich. When I was trying to bring the inner impulses underlying the conception of art that we are unfolding here to a wider public. This did arouse a considerable degree of interest among people. For I gave lectures of this kind in Munich in February and in May, and had to give each of them twice. Herr von Bernus assured me that there were so many inquiries that each of the public lectures where I presented the principles of my conception of art, as they have found expression here in the building, could have been given four times over. But if one were looking for agreement, one would of course be less pleased by the critic of a Munich newspaper, who exhibited what might be called a highly refined form of humorous bearing of teeth. It was particularly amusing, since an inner resentment toward what the writer was unable to understand made itself felt. His sentiments were not so much spoken as spat out, if you may forgive the expression. This was made evident by the very interest aroused by the matters under consideration, where honesty and sincerity came to expression in contrast to what otherwise emanated from this artistic center, for after all this is Munich, the famous Munich. Thus one could see how in this center of artistic activity both the most intelligible and the most unintelligible things were said. In this very discrepancy there is an example of how the two streams of which I have spoken to you exist in our present time and how we need to be conscious that we are involved in a struggle of essential importance for the future of the world. I am certainly not saying all this because I would in some way aim to have a good press, in quotes, when things that matter to us have publicity. For the moment we had a good press, I would think there must be something wrong, an untruth must have entered into something that we have done. All these things make us thoroughly aware that it is very necessary for us to stand resolutely on the ground of our cause, for nothing could lead us into greater confusion than if we sought to make any kind of compromise with what the outer world would consider it right for us to do. Only the principles underlying our cause can give us guidance for what we have to do. There has, recently, also been an ever-growing interest in a number of places in Eurythmy, which, while more indirectly connected with the core of our activities, is nevertheless inwardly associated with it. And when we who were present remember how Eurythmy, for example, was received in one particular place, where it had scarcely been seen before, and was, to an extent, a new experience for those who saw it, namely in Hamburg, this reception of something associated with our cause should be recalled with the deepest satisfaction. It was precisely in Hamburg that it was possible to see the deep significance of the impulses which can likewise spring from a cause such as ours. People were there who were actually witnessing a proper performance of Eurythmy for the first time. It will also probably become possible to reach a public audience in this way. But in such a situation we must stand on very firm ground and do nothing that is not wholly consistent with our cause. It would otherwise very soon be seen that if things go beyond a certain point, people would be rash to suppose that I am prepared to be flexible over matters that I am personally involved with. Most of you already know that I am, of course, always ready to go along with everyone in every respect, where the point at issue is not a matter of principle, but where a purely human concern has come to the fore. However, when it is a question of approaching the threshold where a matter of principle would have even in the smallest degree to be denied, I shall show myself to be inflexible. Thus at the present time, when there is so much dancing to be seen, 
parenthesis, for there is dancing everywhere. It is quite dreadful. If you live in a city, you could watch dancing displays every evening. Close parenthesis. If it should be thought, and I have good reason to say this, although I am not referring to any specific instance, that by giving public performances of Eurythmy we had the intention of allying ourselves with a journalistic empty-headedness that makes claims for attention, I would protest against this in the most vigorous way possible. A feeling for what is good taste needs to arise solely out of the cause that we share. Sometimes we also have to remember, especially when we meet one another again, to do what is needful with a fine-tuned will in accordance with our spiritual impulses. These spiritual impulses will have much to fight against. It is no longer enough merely to speak of prejudice, for these forces work too strongly to be encompassed by such a weak term. Suffice it to say that these impulses have much to battle with. I have on several occasions referred to the great sickness of our time, which consists in a lack of control over one's thought life. For the activity of thinking is already in itself a spiritual life, when rightly understood. It is because people have so little regard for their life of thinking that they so seldom find their way into the spiritual worlds. Again and again I find it necessary to say, from a variety of different aspects, that people give an unbelievably great consideration to the mere content of thoughts. But the content of thoughts is what is of the least importance about them. True, a grain of wheat is a grain of wheat. That is indisputable. But even though a grain of wheat is a grain of wheat, when you put it into good fertile ground, you obtain a lush ear of wheat. If you put it into ground that is barren and stony, you either get nothing at all or a very poor specimen. But on such occasion you are dealing with a grain of wheat. Let us speak of something other than grains of wheat. Instead of a grain of wheat, let us say the, quote, idea of a free humanity, close quote which is such a topic of conversation today. Thus, many will say that the idea of a free humanity is the idea of a free humanity. It is just the same as a grain of wheat being a grain of wheat. But it is a different matter whether the idea of a free humanity flourishes in a heart, in a soul where this heart and soul is fertile ground, or whether the idea of a free humanity, exactly the same idea with the same foundation, is being nurtured in Woodrow Wilson's head. Just as a grain of wheat cannot flourish if it is sown in stony ground or among rocks, all the so-called beautiful ideas that are put forward in the programs of Woodrow Wilson signify nothing if they come from this head. Especially this is something that modern man finds infinitely difficult to understand, because he is of the view that people relate to the content of programs, to the content of ideas. But the content of programs, the content of ideas, has as little significance as the germinating power of a grain of wheat before it is sown in ground, which can offer it suitable conditions for growth. Thinking in accordance with reality is so vitally necessary for people today. For something else is connected with the unreal thinking of the present, namely that people are surprised by almost all that happens. Indeed, one might ask if there is anything that has not surprised humanity in the last few years. People are surprised by everything, and they will continue to be a lot more surprised than they are now but they will not have anything to do with what is really going on in the world. Hence, it is also impossible to persuade people today to bring any foresight to bear on their affairs. If one is working with mere ideas, one can from any standpoint substantiate everything 
by means of anything. If one is working with the mere content of ideas, one can indeed substantiate everything, with everything. This is also something that increasingly needs to be gone into more and more deeply, but no one really wants to do this. Generally, when one speaks of such things and gives examples, no one really believes what one says because the examples seem so grotesque. But our whole modern cultural life is fairly buzzing with these phenomena which manifest themselves in such grotesque ways. I know that many of you will not take it kindly if I give you a really unusual idea as an example, but this is what I propose to do. This concerns a university professor, an old, well-respected university professor who stumbled upon the fact that in the course of his long life Goethe was attracted by various women. So this dawned upon a university professor who had taken on the task of thoroughly studying Goethe's life and the lives of those associated with him. Despite not being a professor at a European university, he has of course made it his business to go about these studies as thoroughly as only a professor at a university in Central Europe would normally do. He let the whole gallery of Goethe's ladies pass before his soul in a kind of review in their relationship to Goethe. And what did he discover? I can tell you almost in his very words. He found that each of the women whom Goethe loved for a while during his life can be said to have been a kind of Belgium whose neutrality he violated, and that he then sighed that his heart bled for needing to take advantage of a shining innocence. But he did not forget to assert on each occasion, like the German Chancellor, that the realm of violated neutrality would have deserved a better fate, but that he, Goethe, could not have done otherwise, since his destiny and the rights of his individual life obliged him to sacrifice the one he loved and even to offer up the pain of his own heart on the altar of the duty that he owed to his own immortal ego. I could regale you with many other bizarre ideas from this book. You would ask what purpose this would serve, but there is a good reason for this, for you find ideas of this sort all over the world today. The ideas of people today are of this nature. And it is not for nothing that such ideas should manifest themselves in literature, where the essence of human thinking appears. For this view is represented by Santayana, a professor at Harvard University in America, a well-respected Spaniard who is, however, completely Americanized. His book was written during this present catastrophe, and its French edition was introduced by Boutreau, who had given a great eulogy of German philosophy in Heidelberg shortly before the war. This book is called titled Egotism in German Philosophy. Bracket. Rudolf Steiner referred to it by the title of its French translation. Close bracket. And its publication was no chance event, but is entirely characteristic of present-day thinking. For with a similar ease displayed by Professor Santayana, in comparing the violation of Belgian neutrality with Goethe's behavior toward a number of women, do these people of today form a binding connection with what is furthest removed from their true nature? The fact is that, if you really take notice of what is going on, this thinking confronts you in all realms of so-called modern science. It is the task of those spiritual impulses to which our anthroposophically oriented science of the spirit is dedicated to combat three basic evils in the present so-called culture of present-day humanity. It has no choice but to fight against these three basic evils. One of these basic evils manifests itself in the realm of thinking, another in the realm of feeling, and the third in the realm of the will. In the realm of thinking, we have gradually reached the point where people are only able to think 
in the manner of a thinking that is bound to the physical brain. But this thinking, which is so closely wedded to the physical brain, has no wish to soar freely to the spiritual domain and is condemned in all circumstances to be narrow-minded and limited. The most significant symptom of modern scientific thinking is narrow-mindedness, limitation of outlook. To be sure, great things can be achieved in this limited domain, as exemplified by modern science. But no element of genius is needed for science as it is conceived of today. This narrow-mindedness, limitation of outlook, is what must be challenged in the intellectual realm. Today my intention is merely to present in outline what we shall speak of later in greater detail. In the realm of feeling, the situation is that people have gradually arrived at a certain Philistinism. This is the only word for it, pettiness, Philistinism, being confined to certain limited circles. This is the main characteristic of the Philistine, that he is incapable of being interested in the wider affairs of the world. Parish pump politicians are always Philistines. Of course, this cannot suffice in the realm of spiritual science, for here one cannot limit oneself to a narrow circle. There is even a need for us to be interested in what lies beyond the earth, and hence in a very wide circle indeed. It does, of course, annoy people if someone merely suggests the idea of wanting to know something about wider matters, such as the old moon, old sun, and old Saturn. But Philistinism needs to give way in all areas to non-Philistinism if spiritual science is to be able to make any mark. Sometimes this is not an easy matter, for it requires an ability unreservedly to face up to the matter at hand, and moreover in an unprejudiced way. Recently, something rather awkward happened in our midst, but I prevented any serious development of what was potentially present in the situation. As you will recall from my lectures in Zurich last year, among various examples I gave then of how Darwinism can be overcome through scientific investigation itself, I refer to the excellent book by Oskar Herpig, titled Das Werden der Organismen, How Organisms Come into Being. Both now and whenever I have had the opportunity, I have mentioned this outstanding book. Very soon after this book was published, there appeared a shorter book by the same Oskar Herpig, where he speaks about social, ethical, and political life. And I then thought to myself that it could well happen that some of our members, having heard that I said that Oskar Hedwig's book Das Werden der Organismen is a very fine book, will believe that I regard Oskar Hedwig as an infallible authority. The second publication by Oskar Hedwig is a worthless book, one written by someone who is unable to put together a single coherent thought in the realm of social, ethical, and political life. I feared that some of our members might have judged that this book had some merit simply because its author was the same Oscar Hertwig. So I had to anticipate any possible problems by taking hold of any opportunity to draw attention to the fact that I consider this second book by the same author who had written a first-rate scientific book to be a worthless piece of foolish nonsense written by a man who lacks the capacity to speak of what he is addressing here. Our anthroposophical spiritual science does not allow one to pass idly from one thing to the other without examining the facts anew without prejudice. It demands from people that they carefully consider the actual reality of each individual case. Philistinism is something that will disappear if the impulses of spiritual science become widespread. So much for the realm of feeling. 
and in the realm of will there is something that has especially, in recent times, taken hold of mankind in the widest sense, something that I can only call ineptitude. Because of the limitations of what one learns in a narrow circle, people today are, by and large, very able within the limits of a narrow circle, but somewhat inept with respect to everything outside this circle. One comes across men who can't even sew on a button. Ineptitude outside a very limited circle is what is especially prevalent in the realm of the will. Anyone who takes hold of what we call spiritual science, not with purely abstract thoughts, but with his whole being, will see that this spiritual science goes right into the dexterity of the hands, that it makes a person more capable and enables him to extend his interest over wider areas and his will over a wider world. Of course, spiritual science is still too weak to overcome ineptitude altogether, but the more intensively we cultivate it, the more will it be able to deal with this problem. So I would say that there are three barriers to the acceptance of spiritual science today. Narrow-mindedness on the intellectual plane, Philistinism, that is pettiness in the realm of feeling, and ineptitude in the realm of the will. People love these three qualities today, even if they are not fully conscious of doing so. Nothing in the whole world arouses a greater affection today than ineptitude, philistinism, and narrow-mindedness. And because people love these three qualities, it is not easy for them to reach forward to the wider vistas that they need to discover, to all that is connected with the names of Araman and Lucifer. It is precisely here that there is something important to be understood in our time. For one of the many features of our age is that a very important transition is taking place from the Luciferic to the Aramonic domain. And as this transition comes to manifestation, not only elsewhere but also here in Switzerland, one can also speak of it here. In this region the former is perhaps of less significance because of the habitual customs of the Swiss, but the latter shows every prospect of becoming more important in this country. In certain respects, Mankind is in a process of transition from Luciferic to Aramonic faults, from Luciferic impulses running counter to human evolution to Aramonic counter impulses. Certain impulses that formerly held sway in the educational domain were of a thoroughly Luciferic nature. In this domain, as we all, with the exception of the youngest of us, knew very well when we were young, one has had to deal with ambition and vanity. Thus one was confronted, perhaps less here in Switzerland, but on a fairly broad scale elsewhere in the world, with ambition and vanity, with orders and titles and so forth. The entire life's path of many people was based on these luciferic impulses of vanity and ambition, on being of greater worth than other people. Just try to think back to how educational affairs were indeed founded on such luciferic impulses. At the present time there is an endeavor to replace these luciferic impulses with aramonic ones. They are enshrouded today behind the concept of, quote, ability tests, close quote. This is the aramonic equivalent to the luciferic encouragement of ambition and vanity in the child. The aim today is to seek out the most gifted, those who in any event are most successful in class, and from these certain individuals are selected. Ability tests are then carried out with these children, intelligence tests, memory tests, tests of their powers of comprehension, and so on. This is something for which the Swiss have a strong predisposition. 
although the Luciferic aspect has played a lesser role here, the Aramanic aspect is already manifesting itself in germinal form in the way these ability tests are understood. For these ability tests proceed from the intellect, from science, from present-day academic psychology. Then those gifted ones who are to be tested are made to sit down and they are given these written words, murderer, mirror, murderer's victim. And they sit there, poor lambs, in front of the three words, murderer, mirror, and murderer's victim, and they are supposed to look for connecting links between them. One child finds the following link. The murderer is creeping up on his victim, but the victim has a mirror in which the murderer is reflected, and so the victim is able to save himself. So much for the first child. His powers of comprehension enable him to connect the three words. Now comes another. A murderer is creeping up on his victim and sees himself in a mirror. His face appears to him in the mirror as the face of someone with a bad conscience. And so the murderer leaves the victim alone on account of seeing his face in the mirror. These are the connections made by the second child. The third child arrives at a different way of combining the words. A murderer is creeping up and finds a mirror. He bangs into it. The mirror falls over and makes a terrible noise as it comes crashing down. The murderer's victim hears this racket and is in time to defend himself against the murderer. The last child is the cleverest. The first one merely found the most obvious combination of ideas. The second described a related moral aspect, while the third has found a very complicated connection of ideas. He is the most gifted. Well, this is more or less how it goes. One is expected to add a little coloring of one's own when making even only a brief description. But this is how children's abilities are going to be tested to find out those who are most able. One thing is certain. If those who invented these methods were to think of the great people whom they revere, such as Helmholtz and Newton, they would have to say that every single one of them would have been viewed as the most untalented little fellows if they had been given these tests. The whole exercise would have been completely pointless. For Helmholtz, who is definitely regarded by those who design these tests as a great physicist, was hydrocephalic and was not at all gifted in his youth. What is it that people are wanting to test? Merely the outer organism, simply what may be considered as man's physical instrument, the purely aramonic aspect of human nature. If the fruits of these ability tests are ever to have any significance for mankind, even more awful thought forms will arise than those that have led to the present human catastrophe. The problem is that if one speaks to people today of what may perhaps lead to catastrophic events in a hundred years or so, this does not interest them. But we are living now in this transition from a Luciferic educational system to an Aramonic one, and we need to be among those who know how to understand such matters. Human beings need to transform creative energies for the future into forces of the present. But this is what is demanded from us today, to confront the immediate reality of the present in an utterly true and unprejudiced way. One can have some very strange experiences in doing this. I do not know whether I have already mentioned here an interesting experience of mine. Among the writings of Woodrow Wilson, there is one about freedom, while another is just called literature. These writings have been much admired and are still greatly admired by many. The one called Literature includes an interesting essay which Woodrow Wilson had written earlier about the historical development of America. 
There are also some other interesting essays by Woodrow Wilson that he had previously written on far-ranging aspects of history. When I read these writings, I had an interesting experience. I found certain sentences which seemed remarkably familiar to me, and which, nevertheless, had not been copied from anywhere, and yet they seemed remarkably familiar. And it very soon occurred to me that these sentences of Woodrow Wilson's could equally well have been written by Hermann Grimm. Indeed, many of them can even be found word for word in Grimm. I love the work of Hermann Grimm, as you well know. I do not exactly love Woodrow Wilson. Nevertheless, I cannot for that reason obscure the objective fact that with respect to the subject matter, whole sentences of Hermann Grimm's lectures and essays could simply have been taken from them and incorporated into Wilson's essays and, vice versa, sentences of Wilson's transposed into the works of Hermann Grimm. As far as the simple wording of the text is concerned, these two people are saying exactly the same thing. But what we have to realize today is that when two people are saying the same thing, it is not the same. For the interesting fact is that Hermann Grimm's sentences are personally fought for. He has struggled to formulate them painstakingly by degrees. Woodrow Wilson's very similar sounding sentences derive from a strange obsessiveness. The man is possessed by a subconscious ego that forces these sentences into conscious life. Whoever is able to evaluate such things realizes that this is an instance of the general truth that whereas a grain of wheat is a grain of wheat, it makes a difference what kind of soil the grain of wheat is sown in. It makes a difference whether someone makes an idea his own by struggling for it bit by bit in his own distinctly personal way, or whether one arrives at this idea by being possessed by the subconscious with the result that everything rings forth from a possessed subconscious, from a consciousness that is possessed by the subconscious. Thus, it is a question today of understanding that what matters is not the content of programs, but the living life that mankind lives. One can teach materialistic philosophy or the philosophy of mere ideas, one can teach a science that is purely materialistic, and it is possible to be an excellent European scholar by teaching such a science, a credit to the university and moreover a worthy citizen. There are quite a number of such people, I would say. They can be found everywhere, these ornaments and luminaries of science who are at the same time irreproachable worthy citizens. This is indeed thoroughly possible. But take some particular idea, such as the struggle for existence, to mention a pretty commonplace idea, or an idea of the kind that more mild-mannered people like Oscar Hertwig advocate, or ideas upheld by Spencer and Mill or Boutreau and Bergson, who are certainly not aiming to penetrate to the spiritual domain, but fail to go beyond a philosophy of mere ideas. But there is more to this than meets the eye. For if we take these ideas of materialistic science, it is true that they can flourish in the brains of good citizens, as I say. But whereas a grain of wheat is a grain of wheat, it makes a difference whether a grain of wheat is growing in fertile or stony ground. And it equally makes a difference whether the same scientific idea which can dawn on someone in Europe brings credit to science and makes its mark at universities has emerged from the brains of university lecturers or whether it derives from that of a person who has a brother who, while still a young man in the, at the end of the 1880s, when he was a luminary of science in a laboratory in St. Petersburg, a man who was richly imbued with ideas about chemistry and was honored with a special medal by all those working with him, for he was highly respected while still a young man, and then this brother suddenly disappears. He has been marked out by the university authorities, 
and suddenly he vanishes. In all manner of roundabout ways, his colleagues are led to discover that he has, meanwhile, been hanged for taking part in the conspiracy against the reactionary Tsar Alexander III. Such facts illumine current events like a flash of lightning. So it makes a difference whether the same idea lights up in the brain of a worthy West European university professor or in the brain of this man's brother who was hanged in such circumstances. When it enters the brain of this brother, it changes this brother into a Lenin, for the brother of this person who was hanged was Lenin, And the same idea then becomes the driving force behind everything that you now see emerging in Eastern Europe. An idea is an idea, just as a grain of wheat is a grain of wheat. But one must ask oneself whether an idea is the same if it arises in the brain of a university professor or in the brain of the brother of the man who was hanged. One must have the will to gaze into those depths of existence where lie the true impulses underlying events. Moreover, one must have the courage to reject the empty phrases of programs and the ideas of scientists who believe that if they advocate something or other it will have a particular outcome. By means of a certain content one can advocate this or that idea. But what happens as a consequence depends on the relationship of this idea to a particular area of actual life, just as what happens to a grain of wheat depends on whether it falls in fertile or unfertile ground. It is necessary for mankind to seek in every sphere of life the path from abstraction, which in the present grave circumstances is everywhere leading to illusion or to chaos, to reality which can be found only in a spiritual approach, a spiritual attitude. However long it may take, this is the only path whereby mankind can find healing and blessing amidst the confusion that prevails today. This is what should be inscribed in our hearts, something in which we can feel united. This is something with which we should greet one another in earnest, that we share in this knowledge which has the potential to be the cure for mankind's afflictions. They can be healed. But one would in vain try to do so with quackery of any kind. They must be healed by something the lack of which has brought mankind into chaos. Leninism would never have been able to take hold in the East if materialistic science which sometimes does not even believe itself to be materialistic, had not been taught in the West. For what is done in the East is, in an immediate sense, a child of materialistic science. What emerged through Karl Marx was a changeling. The true child of materialistic science already exists in the East, but one must have the will to acquire a real insight into these things. This, my dear friends, is in a certain sense the background against which our building stands out. And the individual human beings working on this building think about it in a way that truly stands apart from the ideas that motivate people in so many countries today. One may well imagine that out there in other lands, There are many people who consider that here human individuals are living who keep aloof from what preoccupies the world and, as these people believe, should indeed preoccupy it. It might be thought that people are viewing this place in a reproachful way. Those who have their hearts and souls in this building do not need to trouble themselves about such a reproach. For even if this building does not fulfill its task, even if this building does not achieve its purpose, what is working on this building and what is being achieved by those who are working with dedication on this building is something of the greatest importance in the present, something that has the potential to extricate mankind from its present predicament. 
And if people elsewhere believe that those working here are far removed from the tasks of humanity today, one must say to these people, here we are working on what is most important and most essential for the present. But these other people do not recognize this. They as yet know nothing of these things. But much will depend on mankind as a whole wanting to know something of what is happening here. Once again, let it be emphasized that the point is not whether this building achieves its purpose, although it would be good if it did so. What matters is that the work on this building is being inspired by certain ideas that people have discovered for working on this building. Moreover, it is not the content of these ideas, but the manner in which these ideas live that gives humanity impulses for the future whereas the ideas that so many believe in today are essentially ideas of a former age, which have a death-like tendency and are ripe for the dissolution that now awaits them. We shall speak of this further tomorrow.